<laughs> this is hilarious. Hilariously funny. And fun. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you have a quick shifter up and down, it's fun. And uh, a, a very loose electronic dynamic ESA suspension. Electronic dampening suspension, and it's fun. Piece of cake. No problem for the XR. <laughs> as long as I pick my way through here. Ah. Tarmac. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah, we just came from up there. Oh, there, there are the buildings over there. And meandered all the way back through there. Hi guys, nothing to prove here. Today's a beautiful day because any day one can be out on two wheels is a beautiful day. And yes guys, it's time for the 6,000 kilometer update of this bike and how it feels and what are my impressions after, well actually 6,100 and some kilometers. And I just got back, that's why this is filthy, uh, just got back from a 3,600 kilometer trip to the Alps. Nine days, one day down, seven days there, one day back. So, two days to get down and back, and seven days we spent in the Alps. And this was a blast. And I really put this bike through its paces, as you saw in the intro there. We even did a little bit of off road. Uh, Probably shouldn't have been on some of that road with these street tires, but it still did it. With 170 millimeters of travel on the front, it still did it. And it wasn't that bad, actually. Uh, we'll have more footage coming up here a little bit later. Uh, probably I'll take you down that trail for about uh, three or four minutes to show how this is actually performing. Uh, also, highway, we're going to do all of these stuff, all of this stuff, uh, and also, yes, the nitpicks. What did I initially criticize in my earlier reviews, and are those things beginning to really bother me right now, especially after 6,000 kilometers, and especially after a nine-day trip down to the Alps and back? Uh, so living here in northern Germany, it takes a day to get to the Alps and then a day back. So we wanted to spend a week down there. So that was seven days down there in the French and the Italian Alps. Uh, we were going back and forth. So now you guys know about almost all the way down to uh, uh, Monaco. Uh, oh, we didn't quite get there because uh, then the traffic increases and tourists and all this stuff and we wanted good roads with no traffic and uh, for seven days and that's what we found most of the time also i will be doing a video series probably this fall on all the footage that i captured from that ride from those seven days down in the alps probably a three or four 15 minutes each video series i'll do in the fall uh, when I have time to sit down and edit, I have literally hours and out days and days of footage from my helmet and also the 360 camera that was mounted to my handlebar. Uh, and the hotels we stayed at uh, and the sites and the passes that we went over. Uh, simply because right now it's riding season and I would rather not spend uh, uh, you know 20 hours per episode editing looking for footage and, and I would rather spend it out riding motorcycles and doing reviews for you guys. And then this fall, when I have more time, then I'll sit down and put together a series and launch it in probably October, November-ish, somewhere in there. All right, let's get into the numbers. First, let's take a look at some highway riding. How is this doing 
on the highway. Now, as you can see here, we're on the Autobahn, and of course I'm doing 150 kilometers per hour. But the first thing I want to talk about on the highway is vibration. And first of all, at 120, 130 kilometers per hour, which is, you know, 75 to 80 miles an hour, which is really all we're really going to be doing, to be honest with you. There's almost no vibration in the foot pegs. Very, very a minute amount in the handlebars, but not enough to bother you at this at 120, 130. Now, once you get up to this speed here that we're doing at 150, uh, which is 93, 94 miles an hour, now you start to feel the little vibration in the foot pegs and more pronounced in the handlebars. Because once you start getting up to seven grand, that's where your parallel twins really start to, to vibrate. Also, how is the wind buffeting? Well, at this speed, at the 150, it was pretty bad. <laughs> Let's just be honest. But down at the 120, 130, it's not bad at all, unless you have a crosswind. Then it's, of course, terrible. Um, but uh, at 120, 130, for the wind protection that you get with this machine and the, the footprint of this bike, it's very good wind protection, to be quite honest with you. Now, uh, let's go on to stability at, even at this speed, at the 152, as you can see, 154. Uh, I was very surprised. For a middleweight sport tour, this is, uh, it felt like a heavyweight, to be honest with you. Uh, you can see I'm talking with one hand on the handlebar, do, doing over 90 miles an hour uh, with the cruise control on. Uh, so, stability, I was impressed at, the, at those speeds. Also, fuel economy at those speeds, well, at 150, of course, it was terrible. Um, but at, at, at usually around 130, I'm getting 5.4, 5.5 liters per 100 kilometers. Uh, and, but when you start getting up to the 150, and now you see 200, <laughs> 220, we did get it up to 229 kilo, um, kilometers per hour. And then your fuel economy really dropped to like 5.6. <laughs> but overall fuel economy was about 3.8, to be honest with you. Uh, when you are not um, getting on the gas and really giving it the beans, so to speak. Uh, but here, yeah, you'll go way above 5.6 liters per 100 kilometers, really, guys. And, uh, yeah, that's just, so reality, highway, if you're doing 120, 130 kilometers per hour, which is 70 to 80 miles an hour, you're going to get about uh, 5.4, 5.2, 5.4. Uh, and then if you are going below that, in everyday normal riding, uh, my overall average for this last trip was right around 4.5, 4.6. Uh, and... But my best tank, when we were all doing under 100 kilometers per hour, so under 60 miles an hour, I was getting 3.8, which is really good uh, for this bike, for a 900cc parallel twin. I was, I was in the weight, 219 kilos. I was really surprised for the weight. Now, I just mentioned the 895cc parallel twin. The power... Uh, 103 brake horsepower British or, or American or 105 PS if you're here in Germany. Uh, how was it at altitude? Let's take a look at this clip here. Oh, look at that mountainside. That is so cool. Wow. Oh, look at the snow up there. Oh, I've got to pay attention. As you saw in that clip, no problems passing at altitude. That was at about 2,000 meters, so uh, 6,500 feet. Uh, so you're over a mile high there. Uh, and this thing didn't really get out of breath. You d I, I didn't notice a difference until I got to about 2,500 meters. And then I started to notice 
I had to give it a little more RPMs to get the same power. Uh, but that's going to happen with any bike. Uh, but then you start to notice. So as far as altitude, pff, no worries with this bike. Now, um, as long as you kept it in the three to 7,000 RPM range, that power band basically is no problems, no complaints in the power, the roll-on, passing, anything. Now, how is this bike with the quick shifter? And you guys, if you remember the first review that I did with this and the second and the long term review, I criticized the quick shifter. And has my opinion softened or gotten worse? Well, the quick shifter has not improved, it's the same. In fact, watch this clip here. That was a fault upshift BMW. I guess I didn't give it enough input. I don't like that when that happens. It, it pauses the motor and then doesn't shift and then brings the motor back in and, bah, and brings the RPMs up. I don't like that. It's very disturbing, disconcerting. If you don't give the quick shifter enough input to go up there like that, it'll do that. And I don't like that. Okay, so problems with the quick shifter, these faults of shifts. Um, it seems 25 to 75 percent it had those uh, throttle uh, it was clunky anything less than 25 percent throttle or more than 75 percent throttle the upshifts and downs or the ups were good uh, the downs were usually good uh, almost all the time yeah you, know, you guys see me pausing um, I'm still not quite 100 percent happy with the quick shifter so if you guys are debating on whether or not to get a quick shifter with this bike, <laughs> although, although I am happy that I got it for when I am on full throttle and racing like Valentino Rossi or like the think I am, uh, then the quick shifter is great. <laughs> but anything between 25 and 75, it's clunky. I'm just being honest and this is a nitpick. And is it bothering me though? No, I guess I'm just getting used to it. That's all. Okay. Enough of the rant about the quick shifter. <laughs> now let's take a look at off-road capability. I've gotten many questions on the, in the comments from you guys. Does this have any off-road capability? And if so, how much? So, all right, well, let's take a look at this clip. Okay, let's try it. Probia. Let's try it. Okay, I just gave Uli permission to go off-road, off-pavement. <laughs> let's see where he takes us. <laughs> oh, jump. Whoop. Oh, this is... <laughs> this is hell on these tires. These poor Michelin... What are, what are they, Road 5 GTs? <laughs> probably have to replace them now. I should probably check my tire pressure, huh? Let's go over 2.4 on the front and 2.7 on the rear. Okay, I guess that's not that bad. There's my tire pressure. Uh, Uli's got enduro mode. And it just softens up that suspension so he can take it, it just soaks up these bumps and rocks. Whereas me, no, I'm a real man. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Real men don't need enduro mode like your cowardly GS guys. <laughs> oh, 
Real men do this on street bikes. <laughs> oh, this is a blast. Well, if yeah, Uli's going slow for me. I'll, I he 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 said, hey, you know what? I know the the XR isn't a GS. It's not an adventure bike, so I'll take it easy. Otherwise, he would be tearing through here. <laughs> He's actually going slow for me. <laughs> and I said, thank you. Yes, appreciate it. <laughs> We got some good bumps here. Oh yeah, piece of cake. No problem for the XR. <laughs> as long as I pick my way through here. Ah, tarmac. Oh yeah. Ah. Yeah, we just came from up there. Oh, there, there are the buildings over there. And meandered all the way back through here. You ready? All right. Okay, as you can see there, the XR did, did okay uh, under those road conditions. With 170 millimeters of travel, it's not too bad. Yeah, it's, it's not an enduro bike. No, it's not an adventure bike. So yeah, you could really feel it. Uh, but Uli, the 1250 GS adventure guy, he says, yeah, I just stick it in enduro mode. And pfft. But he was going slow for me. So two thumbs up. Thank you, Uli, for going slow for me <laughs> on the XR. Uh, but uh, off-road capability, it is very limited, guys. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, even if you stuck some trail tires in 9010s or 8020s on here, still you're going to be limited by the suspension. Okay, next on the list. Let's talk about the brakes. These are the M.432s, and I criticize the brakes on the 1250RS for having brake fade. These, I never encountered that in the, seven, in the nine days of the trip that I was down there in the Alps, believe it or not. So I think it might have to do with the weight, because the RS is about 20 kilos heavier than this. Uh, but other than that, I can't figure out why I didn't get any brake fade. And I was literally beating on these tires with those. As you can see, I have uh, wore these, the, the, wear, the wear bar down on these tires, on the front tires especially, on the sides. It's, it's pretty much gone. Center, it's uh, still got a little bit. I need to replace them. So after 6,100 kilometers and riding in the Alps, that's also a problem. The roads there are so, like riding on sandpaper, which is good for grip, but terrible for tire wear. It really wears your tires down. Um, so no complaints about the brakes. And also these, these Michelin Road 5 GTs, twos, uh, no complaints. Not a problem with them in wet. Uh, not a problem with them as far as grip. And as you can see in off-road, they're not bad either. <laughs> Suspension. Still, my same complaint, non-adjustable front. Uh, it's a nitpick. Is it irritating me, though? No, it's not. I'm very surprised. The initial dive, once you get used to that, and then they're firm and solid and confidence-inspiring in a corner. Uh, the only non-adjustable front suspension that is better than this is the uh, 790 Duke, the WPs. Uh, I, I go on record when I did that review, I said these are the best non-adjustable suspension, front suspensions I've ever ridden on, and I still go on that record. This is getting close to that though, so that is a compliment, BMW. Um, after the uh, suspension, the seat is hard. <laughs> I, that's why I ordered a comfort seat. I, I was hoping that the comfort seat would come before I go. I went on this trip, but it didn't. Uh, this seat was okay for the first few days, but by day five, 
I, yeah, and after 2,000 kilometers, 2,500 kilometers, I really was dreading sitting on this. Uh, so please, BMW plant in Berlin, ship me my comfort seat. Please, please, please. <laughs> um, but the seat was okay. Uh, and, and, and also, I want to talk about the range with this. I'm pointing to the gas tank here. Only a 15 and a half liter tank. I would like more, especially riding with a GS Adventure guy who's got 30 liters uh, on this trip. Um, but you could get 300 kilometers on this tank. Uh, if, you're just, if you're keeping it below 100 kilometers per hour, you could get 400 on this tank, no problem. Um, so I would like a little bit more, but that is not a nitpick nor a complaint. It's just an observation on a sport touring machine. I would like a little bit more. Okay. All around. Ah, something I've forgotten, guys. Costs. Yeah. In 6,100 kilometers, how much has this bike cost me? Other than it's purchased out the door. The first 1,000 kilometer service, 150 euros. Boom, done. <laughs> cool. So uh, my next cost will be tires uh, and also the at 11,000 kilometers, the service. So, so the service on this motor is every 10,000 kilometers. Uh, so I did it at 1,000, so the next one's at 11. Uh, and so then I'll do my next update video for you guys there at 11,000 and then tell you how much it costs to service this at the first 10,000 kilometer, now 11,000 kilometer service. Uh, and then I'll give you the cost for that also, guys. Uh, and then any other, and, and then cost for new tires. I haven't decided what to go with, to stay with the Michelin tires or go with a different one like the Pirelli Angel GTs or what if you guys have a suggestion for me post below because I'm kind of new in this sport touring middleweight segment with tires I'm more of the performance oriented nakeds super nakeds sport bike tires but sport touring tires I'm not so familiar with so if you guys got some good suggestions post them below and I would appreciate that and I'll read your comments I do read you guys' comments sometimes it takes me uh, a couple of days to reply to comments um, but you know because I'm in the Alps for nine days <laughs> uh, alright guys I hope you've enjoyed this review uh, if you guys have any other questions about this or something else I should have covered on this oh and the electronic ESA suspension on the rear loved it I was always swinging back and forth from the the road to dynamic excellent loved it all right guys i hope you've enjoyed this review as always ride safe that's the most important thing guys that's number one on the list and number two guys ride like there's nothing to prove take care guys cheers